Tommy's been teaching out of the book of Psalms, and we're still there, Psalm chapter 15. And we have had a lot of songs of lament, you know. We almost had needed to have therapy right after some of the songs because they're, they are uh, sad. They're talking about stories of real-life situations, but that's not going to be the case here, here tonight. This is going to be a fun psalm to look at. It's got some serious things in it. But it's a fun, fun time in God's Word, so I'm looking forward to that. One of my favorite psalms. It is favorite in a lot of ways, but I have to to confess to you, it convicts me. Now, you and I know that we're not convicted by each other, right? We may be troubled by each other. We may be uh, 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 jokingly with one another, talking about how bad we've done on something. But really, conviction comes from God. That's a work that the Holy Spirit does. And it says, Mike, here's an area of your life that I need to to change. You need to let me change you. I used to think that uh, just because of the attitudes of people around me that I was convicted. No, God does the convicting. The scripture says the Holy Spirit will reprove the, the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So that's his God. And as far as I know, none of us have been deputized by the Holy Spirit to do that to, for, for other people. And so, but this is a psalm that although it convicts, it challenges, but it's a psalm that inspires you know when speakers come, they can be pastors, evangelists, teachers, or they can be a speaker that comes, and you know that when they get through, you have been inspired. You have been lifted up. Maybe you've watched a movie that, that just inspired you. Now, I'm going to date myself, but a long time ago in high school, this movie came out about an underdog prize fighter in Philadelphia, and there was an eye and a tiger somewhere in the music, and but... He, uh, of course, you know, he, he stands up there on the steps there and he does this and you've, you probably know who I'm talking about. My older brother's name has the same name, Rocky. Well, do you remember in his training what he used to do in the mornings, what he ate or drank? Raw eggs. So a buddy of mine uh, decided we were going to get in shape. That movie so inspired us and we were going to get up before school before we had to go to school. That's an unusual time for me because I just kind of rolled out of bed. Uh, My little brother, uh, God made him that way. I can't do anything about it. He had curly hair and he had to all straighten it out and everything, you know, but I could comb my hair at night, go to bed. It still looked the same when I got up in the morning. That may be the reason it's all falling out now. I don't know. We decided we were going to run in the mornings and to be true to the movie, we had to drink those raw eggs and I said my buddy asked me you gonna do it yeah you gonna do it and guys I want to confess to you tonight I lied (laughs) I couldn't do it I love eggs but they've got to be cooked I just cannot do anything that didn't didn't make it to the frying pan or cook somehow and I get over there to his house early in the morning we're gonna run did you do your egg yeah I, I did my buddy said did you let's start running let's go and And I just couldn't do it. But we were so inspired. I think I ran once or twice in the morning. He did it for a few weeks, you know. He was a little more dedicated. And the inspiration wore off. This psalm is a psalm of inspiration that is meant, Mike, to not wear off. Now, it doesn't have anything about eating eggs and drinking eggs, so I'm in good shape there. But it is a challenge. It's inspiring, and it's good. And it's so good. Before I get there, though, I want to ask you a question. Most of us here in the room were probably guests at someone's home this Thanksgiving, or we had guests in our home. Is that fair enough to say? You were someone's guest, or you had people in your home, and you were guests. Have you ever, maybe you've already had some invitations to some Christmas parties. There's some years that Holly and I get invitations a lot, and then there's sometimes that people say, well, you know, they're probably getting invitations to everybody, and then they don't give any, and we don't, we don't get too many. But I want to ask you a question. Have you remembered a time when you had uninvited guests? Uninvited guests to some of your get-togethers. When Holly, my wife and I were first married, we, uh, I think we were in our second home that God provided for us to live in, so it was a few years. We always, uh, you know, turned the light off. We weren't kind that slept with the light on or the television on or something like that. So it's usually dark and quiet. 
when it's time for us to go to bed. And so I turn the light off and we lay down to go to sleep and I hear this. Now that's what it sounded like. What in the world would you think that would be? I thought, surely in this home, we don't have, we don't have mice, do we? Oh man, that'd be terrible. I'm calling an exterminator. I'm going to get my, I'm going to do everything to get rid of that. But it didn't sound like what I've heard a mouse before. And I thought, well, I turned the light on in silence. I looked everywhere, all everywhere, and I couldn't find anything. I thought electricity popping like it does sometimes. I couldn't imagine what it was. So I turned the light back off, lay back down, get ready to go to sleep, and I hear... <coughs> and we have no idea what's going on. Needless to say, it was a long night until... We looked in, my wife had been given a gift and it was in a gift bag, really pretty gift bag. And you know how some of those are kind of lined with plastic on the inside? And inside that empty gift bag was from something from hell. I really believe scorpions are from hell. I think that's where they're from. Uh, I'm not scared of a lot of things, but you put a snake and a scorpion in front of me and you can have my house, my car, you can have anything, my wallet, you can have anything you want because I truly believe they are, they are demonic in some way. They've got to be. And inside that little plastic empty bag, almost empty, was a scorpion that was scratching, trying to get out of that plastic bag and wasn't making any traction. And every time I turned the light on, he knew I was looking for him. Now, how's that for a word picture? He was an uninvited guest, needless to say, and I was happy to evict him from our home, and uh, hopefully he went to heaven. I don't know where he went. I, he might have gone the other direction. I don't know. <laughs> Do you know what this psalm is about? It's about who gets invited to God's house. That's literally what this psalm is about. Who gets invited, man or woman, child? Who gets an invitation from God to come to spend time in his house? Let's look as we start. It says there in the beginning, uh, oh, it's a Psalm of David, and it says, O oh Lord, who may abide in your tent and who may dwell in your holy hill? Uh, when we look at the word abide, it talks about coming and spending some time there. And I think it doesn't uh, use a word that means forever because uh, there's going to be a forever place called heaven. And you're headed there, aren't you? I hope you are. If you're not, please visit with some of us tonight. We can't get you there. But you know that old song that Mark just uh, alluded to and, and sang for us a while, a while ago, Let All Earth Keep Silence? It talked about how we couldn't get up to God, but praise God, he came down to us. And so here he's saying, who's going to dwell on your holy hill? Who gets to abide in your tent? Who gets an invitation from God Almighty to come stay at his house? And then the psalmist alludes to the kind of person that gets that. An old movie that I watched a long time ago when a man showed his character, a good character, one of the cowboys said, you're welcome at my campfire anytime. Something had happened to show this man's worthiness so that he could be accepted at that man's campfire. I thought about in the scripture the examples of close relationships between, these all happen to be men, but there's some of women too. But let me remind you of some of them. Uh, David had a very close relationship with his mighty men. His mighty men were fierce warriors that protected him and that fought the battles of God. And those men were, were close to each other. One of my favorite stories in all the scriptures, they're fighting the battles of God. And David said, oh, I long for a drink of water from the Bethlehem's well. That was the city of David. And he was reminiscing about how good that water was from that well. They're out thirsty and hungry and they're fighting God's battles. Well, his mighty men heard that and they fought through the Philistines and went to the well of Bethlehem and scooped up some of that water, fought back through the enemy lines and they came and presented that water to their king that they loved. They had a close relationship there. And that's what you and I are supposed to be doing with each other. We, you and I are supposed to be fighting through enemy lines to give a drink of refreshing, cool water in times of adversity. Remember what David did with that water? 
We can't misunderstand that. He took it and he said, these men's lives are in this cup and he poured it out on the ground. You may think, why would he do that? They risked their lives. Why didn't he drink it? One of the highest things you could do was give a drink offering to God. And David knew that this was such an honorable thing his men did. He gave that back to God. David and Jonathan, close, close brothers. Jesus and the apostles, Moses and Moses was fighting, Joshua fighting the battles of God and Moses was holding up that staff. But just like you and I, he was a human. He got tired and his arm came down. And when his arm came down, the symbol of the power and the, the rod of God, uh, Joshua started losing the battle. And God said quickly to two different men, Aaron and Hur, get up there beside Moses. You get on the one side, the other on the other side, set him on a rock and hold his arms up. And the rod of God was held up. And it says it was held up to the end of the battle, to the closing of the day. And they won the battle. You know who Aaron and her were? They were brother and friend. So that's what you and I need to be to one another too. We need to be welcome at each other's campfire. We need to be men and women of distinction, but men and women of character. My, both of my brothers are Christian men, fine men in their different ways. They are my heroes. Uh, one is, is courageous. He is fearless. The other one, even in the midst of tough times, he has stood strong. And I just love my two brothers. Maybe they'll come and uh, I can introduce them to you someday. But my younger brother, very honest man, known that in business. And an old timer came walking in one day and he was speaking about my little brother and I'm not sure that he knew that we were related, but he talk, called his name and mentioned him. And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, he'll do to tie to. You ever heard that before? He'll do to tie to. And what he meant, if you're looking for somebody steady that will be faithful when the storm comes and the waves crash and the winds blow and adversity comes, he'll do to stick close to because you don't have to worry about him running out. And I thought, I told my brother that, that's one of the highest compliments I think that that man could give you. What does the scripture say? A brother is born for adversity. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The Bible tell, tells us that uh, men sharpen men like iron sharpens iron, and that goes for women too. And so character is so valuable. Church, in church history, we've gone through a lot of different cycles, a lot of different things. Uh, in the beginning, there were times of holding to the letter of the law without mercy. There's some times that, that they, they would hold to, well, it is written here, but there's no grace, there's no mercy in that. It is just a dogmatic, legalistic, this is what it says, you have to do that. Any of you watch the show uh, Caught in Providence on television? Caught in Providence. It's about a judge, and it's usually traffic uh, violations, and they bring people that have been caught speeding, running a stoplight or whatever it was up before this, this judge, and he is awesome. He asks them questions, and they think, oh, no, I'm going to have to pay this big fine. And before it's all over, he's laughing with them, he sees the plight they were in, their need. Sometimes he brings a little child up and says, is your daddy guilty? Uh-huh, he ran the stoplight. You know, and they just tell right on their dad, give him up right there. But he shows mercy. And that's what the show's about. He shows grace to them. So sometimes in the church, there have been, in the Middle Ages, it was a mechanical religion. You go through the motions, that's all it was. During the Reformation, a lot of good things happened. But we came out with creeds and customs we came, came out with conflict because here are those that are saying, no, we need to go back to the Bible. But it, it also brought about pietism. That was a list of rules that if I do this, I'm better than other people. So mark off your list. We still have some of that in the church today. Are you saved? Are you going to heaven? Yeah, I got that done a long time ago, a man told me. How do you get that done? A long time ago. It might have started a long time ago, but we're in that process, aren't we? Pietism, a list of do's and don'ts. It became mechanical Protestantism. 
Then we had revivals, the Wesleyan and American revivals, when God seemed to turn the power on and everybody got excited again. They don't always last. Then we got fundamentalism. And then we got evangelicalism. And there always seems to be the balance between the letter and the spirit of what the words say. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about compromise or changing it, but the Bible says mercy rejoices over judgment. Well, judgment's true and right. That's Bible too. But God loves and desires mercy. Billy Graham was stopped one time, the story goes, for a traffic uh, ticket, a traffic violation, came before a judge. Uh, Billy Graham said, yes, I'm guilty. I, I admit that. Uh, the fine was pronounced. And when Billy Graham was about to pay the fine, he tells the story that the judge who had his robe on stood up, got off his bench, took the robe off and laid it down on the, the bench, walked out in front where Billy was standing. He took out his own wallet. The judge took the money out and he said, here is your fine paid in full. Isn't that pretty cool? I thought about changing my name to Billy Graham, see if that works sometime. But what the judge did was he stuck with the letter of the law. You're guilty. But I'm going to show you mercy and I'm going to pay your ticket. You see what I'm saying? There needs to be the balance of truth and grace. Jesus taught that, truth and grace. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And so in this psalm, we're going to see that. Think about this. God is man's host and man is God's guest as we read this psalm. Oh Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who's going to get an invitation from God to come and stay with him? And who may dwell in your holy hill? Now when you look at Hebrew in the word dwell there, we think of a dwelling as some place where you live permanently. But it actually means to sojourn. To sojourn means you stay a while, you're passing through. Uh, Naomi and Ruth, they sojourned. Elimelech went to sojourn in the land of Moab. He didn't intend to stay there. So that's not talking about you live there all the time. There's going to be a place called heaven that we live with God all the time. But who's going to get invited to spend time with God in his house, in his tent, on his holy hill? <coughs> Would you agree with me that God it needs to be the one who decides who gets the invitation? Isn't that important? Uh, we don't just uh, uh, show up at someone's house because they're having a get-together and say, I want to come. Well, did you get an invitation? No, but I'd just like to come. I think they made movies about that wedding crisis or something. God's the one who decides who is invited. And in this psalm, the next uh, second verse and then the furtherance of it is going to describe the people that God wants in his house. Now, have we all had uninvited guests? What was that movie that had an Uncle Eddie in it? He was always showing up. It's probably a really bad movie, and I just said that on tape. <laughs> Who was Uncle Eddie? Christmas, Christmas Vacation. Yeah, wasn't he just the, the family member that everyone likes to come to their family get-togethers? Let's see who God describes can come. Verse two said, here's the ones, he or she who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. Those of you who teach the Bible, share the Bible from time to time, you know that when you're looking at a passage, you look for key words. Oftentimes they're nouns or verbs. They are words that kind of jump off the page and you think, I need to find out what those words mean. In that verse right there, we see walks, works, and speaks. Those are three different actions that we all do on a daily basis, but it describes the kind of person that we are. How do they walk? How do they speak? How, uh, what kind of works do they do? What is the product of their life? How do they live? These verbs show up. We're going to see in the rest of the passage. Walks, works, speaks, loves what God loves, hates what God hates. Uh, the, he thinks like God, keeps his word. She's faithful with what God, uh, what she or he or she is given. 
They're solid. Look at all the different key words in the passage as we walk down here. Who's invited to God's house? Somebody who's going to walk with integrity. Integrity, we, use, we have the word integer. That means single. That means one. They're not two-faced. You remember the old cowboy and Indian movies when the, 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 uh, the cowboys walk up and they tell some kind of thing and the Indian said, he speaks with forked tongue. You remember that? That's talking out of both sides of your mouth. That's being a hypocrite. It's not telling the truth. To have integrity means that it, it means oneness is complete. We're not speaking one way here and one way in another place. Uh, Tommy talked about being a hypocrite. The word hypocrisy comes from an actor who had, uh, used to have masks over their faces and they would speak out from under the mask and you couldn't tell whether it was true or not because they might be a hypocrite. Romans 12 tells us to let our love be without hypocrisy. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever had people you had dealings with that when they needed something from you, they called you by your first name. They called you by your nickname. They said, oh, it's so good to see you. But when they were through using you, you were invisible to them. They didn't need you anymore. That's a hypocrite. That's somebody that's not being true to you at all. And so that's not who he's talking about here. This is somebody who walks with integrity. They've got true grit. That's a word that integrity, that's actually what we can uh, define that as. They're in the truth. They have courage. They're going to be the same whoever's around. Trustworthy, honest, upright. And it says he walks in integrity. It's not just a yes man. There's some people that can say the right things, but they don't do them. Remember a group in the New Testament that Jesus always warned about that did that? He said, do what they say, but don't do like they do, Matthew 23. What were they called? Pharisees. They were called Pharisees. They wanted to appear on the outside like they were God's people. Bright and shiny on the outside, but on the inside they were full of dead men's bones, Jesus' words. So if you want to be invited to God's Christmas party, if you want to be in his house, dwell in his holy hill, you've got to walk the walk, and it's got to be a walk of integrity. You know another way that you can uh, remember the word integrity? It's how you live when nobody's looking. That's what kind of integrity you have or you don't have. It's who you are in the dark. It's who you are when nobody else is around. Integrity. So he walks with integrity. He works righteousness. That's what's produced out of this person's life. It's a pattern of life and conduct. It's a lifestyle and speaks the truth, not only on the outside, but speaks the truth in his heart. You may be thinking of some right, one right now and you say, I don't know where they're at or what they're doing, but I'll tell you what, they're telling the truth. They've always been a person of truth and what a, what a great reputation that is to have. Who may dwell your holy hill? The one who walks with integrity, works righteousness, speaks truth in his heart. Verse 3, let's go further. We're making a list of who gets invited to God's home. He does not slander with his tongue. Now, slander is not lying against somebody. We all know what that is, lying and telling uh, something that's not true. But slander often involves the truth. It tells something that's true, but it tells it in a shameful way. You're trying to harm the person that it happened to or whatever the circumstances were. It doesn't build up. James tells us in chapter 3 that this tongue, our tongue, is a mighty member of our body. It's strong. It's powerful. And sometimes our tongues bless God, which is good, and then they curse men, which is bad. And James says it ought not to be that way. Ought not to be full of blessing and cursing. In fact, he went on in chapter three to talk about how powerful the tongue was. And he said, the powerful, the, the, the tongue is even set on fire from hell. It can be that damaging. I grew up hearing these words. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Guess what? That's not true. Because words hurt. 
So this guy, this woman, who's going to be invited to God's house, he walks with integrity, integrity, works righteousness, speaks the truth in his heart. That means everywhere. He doesn't change from who he's around. And then he doesn't slander with his tongue. You know that word slander actually talks about chewing somebody up. That's the, the, the Hebrew word, the, the definition, to chew somebody up. That's pretty graphic, talking about someone who's two-faced or double-tongued. They want to defame. They want to accuse. They want to bring somebody down by telling everything they can bad about that person. The Bible teaches us that it is a good thing to keep a secret concealed. How many of you are thinking of someone right now that you can tell a secret to and you know they'll keep that secret? You got a name inside of your your mind right now? I do. I've got friends that I can say, man, I need to tell you something, but you can't tell anybody. Some of them are in this room. And they've proven it year after year. How many of you are thinking of somebody right now? Don't point anybody if they're here tonight, but you, you can't tell them a secret because you know that they can't stand it. They'll be sitting here waiting and they may not wait till the service is over. They're going to start talking to the person next to them or behind them and in front of them and they can't wait to tell what you asked them not to tell. Well, that's not this kind of person. This kind of person doesn't slander. They don't tell your secrets. A man named Hare one time wrote this quote. When will talkers refrain from evil speaking? When listeners refrain from evil hearing. Isn't that good? I knew a young couple, uh, college age, that went to a new church not long ago, and I heard this story. They went up to a new church, began to talk bad about their former church and their former pastor to the new pastor. And as they started doing that, that new pastor said, stop. I don't want to hear anything about him or the church you came to. You may need to go back there and get some things right. If you're going to come here, we don't do those kind of things. And I thought, praise God. And then I found out my daughter's going to that church now. That's the kind of pastor I want my daughter to go and be sitting under his leadership. So number three was, if you want to be invited to God's house, you don't work slander with your tongue. You don't slander. You don't repeat the bad. Man, we've got enough people doing that. Would you agree? We need to talk about some good things. We need to repeat the good things. Our six o'clock news, our 10 o'clock news, they could put, sometimes they put a little tag story at the end, make you feel good, put a picture of a puppy or ducks or something like that. But they could repeat some good things, couldn't they? And so here, you want to be in God's house, you want to get an invitation from him, you won't slander somebody. The next verse says, nor does evil to his neighbor. I want to read Isaiah 33, a couple verses. It says, he who walks righteously and speaks with sincerity, he who rejects unjust gain, that's talking about dirty money, shakes his hands so that they hold no bribe. Someone wants to pay them under the table just a little bit. And this person with integrity says, not me, no way. I'm not taking that for anything. He who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed, he doesn't want to talk about the bad. He doesn't want to see all the bad. He doesn't want to hear when somebody's hurt and how somebody's mistreated. Shuts his eyes from looking upon evil. He will dwell on the heights. His refuge will be the impregnable rock. His bread will be given him. His water will be sure. All throughout the scripture, God says, you want to be with God? Pretty simple. You need to be like God. You want to get invited to be in God's presence? He's telling us how. We got to let him change our lives so we can be like him. The next part of that verse says, he doesn't slander. He doesn't do evil to other people. He doesn't delight to hurt someone and do something bad to someone. And then the next one is, think about this. Nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Now, that's to accuse somebody of something in a shameful way. It means to belittle, to make fun of someone else. Uh, Do you have certain things that bother you worse than other things? I don't know why. When I get to heaven, I'm going to kind of ask God that. 
But one of the icebreaker games that I do sometimes when I'm together is I ask people to write down on a piece of paper, what are your pet peeves? You know what I always find? They'll write pet peeves and I'll read some of them out, out and I come to find out they're writing about the person sitting next to them or their spouse or one of their friends, something that they do that bothers them. I was asked one time, what bothers you? And I said, when somebody, when someone makes fun of somebody else, I just can't stand it. Now, if somebody's making fun of themselves, that's okay. That's kind of funny sometimes. If brothers and sisters or friends are all together and we're laughing about each other and nobody's getting hurt and it's not bad, that's okay. But when somebody literally is making fun of, causing shame for someone else and they're doing it with malicious intent, that's one of mine. I just can't stand it. I just can't stand it. And God's let me all my life want to go and take up for that underdog that's getting made fun of. It's a wonder that I'm still here. But it says, nor takes a reproach against his friend. You know, you know uh, 1 Corinthians 13. It's for, love is forbearing. It's patient. It doesn't think evil. It doesn't delight in iniquity. It doesn't enjoy when someone else gets hurt. Someone said, love is a standard, not a tally sheet. We don't have to mark how many times somebody's done something and then point it out to them. You know how many times you have mistreated somebody? We don't have to cause shame for someone else. Tommy told a story that I want to repeat this morning real quickly. Clara Barton, I think she was the leader in the Salvation Army. Isn't that right? Red Cross, excuse me. Thank you, American Red Cross. Uh, had somebody that did something wrong to her pretty badly. And uh, later on, this person came back to join and help in that organization. And someone came and told Clara Barton, don't you remember? That's the guy. Don't you remember what he did to you? And she said this. I thought it was great. I distinctly remember forgetting that. I need to put that on the wall in my office because I need to look at it several times a day. I distinctly remember forgetting that. What if God remembered all of our faults and all the times I said something, did something, thought something, went somewhere, mistreated somebody? My goodness, I don't think heaven could hold the books that he had to write down. I'm sure glad he doesn't. This guy gonna be at God's invitation he doesn't take up a reproach against his friend. He doesn't talk behind someone's back. One version of the scripture says, a whisperer separates the best of friends. You know what kind of person that is? That's one that'll say, hey, Becky, can I tell you something? Did you know that this lady over here, she said some things about you? I tried to stop her because she shouldn't have been talking like that, but she said some things about you, and I just want you to watch out for her. And then I walk over to that lady and say, hey, you know what? I was just talking with Becky, and we were talking about you a little bit, and she, she was really concerned about your actions. And what have I done there? I have taken oftentimes two friends that should be close, loving, forgiving, and I have pitted them against each other. Sounds like politics, doesn't it? By the way, you know what politics, there's two parts of that word. One of them's poly, that means many, and ticks. You know what ticks are? They are bloodsuckers. <laughs> Just think about that during the election. <laughs> Number four says, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised. Now this one's a little hard for some Christians. I'll put it real simple. We need to love what God loves and we need to hate what God hates. Do you agree with me? The Bible teaches us we need to love what God loves and we need to hate what God hates. David in the, old, in the book of Psalms, the same, same place we're reading here, he says, I hate them that hate you, God, and I hate them with perfect hatred. Now that's unusual language for us. It's not hating the soul. It's not wishing those souls would be damned to, to eternal uh, destination of the lake of fire, but it's hating their deeds. It's hating what they do. And God hates sin. He hates it so badly that he sent Jesus to pay the price for it. So it says, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised. 
A reprobate is somebody that has been rejected over and over and over and over again. They're despised because they have given a track record, a proven uh, record of doing wrong. They have rejected the truth over and over and over and over and over again. You men remember in uh, uh, that movie that, that uh, Tommy quotes all the time? It's real important about who we hang out with. You don't want to hang out with a reprobate because sometimes we think, well, I'm going to date this person. I know they're not a Christian. They're not living right, but I, some of my goods are going to rub off on them. Let me just give you a little theological uh, teaching out of the book of Haggai. Haggai, one of those little books of the Old Testament. The question was asked to the priests. If someone comes and takes holy flesh, this is some meat that they're going to offer on a sacrifice, and it's holy because they follow God's example and it's set apart holy. If that holy touches something that's unclean, does it make that unclean holy? And the priest said, no. Doesn't work that way. God's the only one who's clean who can touch us and make us clean. But if we have holy flesh for a sacrifice and it touches something else, it gets unclean. You have to throw it away and get some more. But if something that is unholy, you're carrying it maybe in your garment, in your apron, and it touches something that is holy, does it make that unholy? And the priest said, yes. The unholy defiles the holy. So when those people say, well, I'm going to date him and I'm going to date her, even though they're not a Christian, do not think that God is going to cause your righteousness to rub off on them. It, the, the opposite will happen. It happens every time. Now pray for them. Don't mistreat them. Love them. But until they get saved, don't date them. Because you're, you're dealing with a grenade with the, the pin pull already. It's in direct disobedience to God. Pray for them, love them, encourage them, be a friend to them, but don't be yoked together in a relationship. And our goodness can never save somebody else. God has to do the saving. And so that doesn't mean we don't run around with people that are lost and pray for them and encourage them. No, we gotta be salt and light in the world. If the only friends you have are saved Christian friends, you need some more friends. Because we need to be friends with them, but we don't need to be unequally yoked together with those unbelievers. So it says, this person's going to be invited to God's house. He despises a reprobate just like God does. Somebody that rejects God, we need to call sin, sin in their life too, just like God does. It means someone who doesn't shrink back from the truth. We have a command to denounce ungodliness. You know one of, one of the ways we do this often? We really preach against sin until it's somebody we're related to. If it comes down to our family, we kind of have a different standard, a different set of rules. And that's so wrong. In whose eyes a reprobate is despised. We've got to hate what God hates. We've got to love what God loves. And we've got to think about things the same way God does. Uh, is that Bible? Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine because they'll turn and trample, trample you. There's sometimes there are rejected reprobates and God says at this time, don't even share the gospel with them. Be prepared to anytime, but there are those that are rejected. Let's go further. He doesn't take up a reproach against his friend in whose eyes a reprobate is despised. God, God hates and, God, and we hate too. God loves, we love. And then it says, but one who honors those who fear the Lord. Folks, it's a fact that we as Christians are supposed to take sides. I know a lot of things in our world today and our education are, are telling us don't take sides, don't take sides. I heard about a man during the Civil War. He didn't want to take sides. He wore a blue coat and gray pants and he got shot by both sides. <laughs> we cannot not take a side but it's not a country side it's not a family side it's not a public opinion side we got to take God's side they beat Peter and John and said don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore the book of Acts you remember what Peter said you men judge 
whether it's right in your sight to obey God or men. But we will obey God and we will not cease to teach and preach in the name of Jesus. Peter took sides. And this person who's going to be in God's presence takes sides. We honor those that fear the Lord. What side are you on? I know what side you're on. I pray with all my heart. You're on God's side. You want to you be with him no matter what those decisions are. The Bible tells us to honor the king, to honor all men, to show honor where it is due. You may say, well, so-and-so doesn't deserve that. It never said whether they deserved it or not. In the book of Acts, the apostle Paul was speaking to a man and, and they had uh, accused Paul of things that he was breaking the law and Paul knew the law a whole lot better than they did. And he turned to this man, this official, and he said, you whitewashed wall. And what he meant by that, you're a hypocrite. You're in this position of government, but you're a hypocrite. And the man sent one of his army guys over there, his police, and he took his fish and he just hit Paul in the face. And Paul said, do you command me to be smitten contrary to the law? You would not want to get in a theological Bible discussion with the apostle Paul. We would lose that one, I promise you. So Paul's quoting scripture, man, you've broken the law, you've broken the law, you've broken the law. And the man that hit him says, we think it was him, said, don't you know it's written that you don't revile the leader of your people, the high priest? Does anybody remember what Paul said? He says, my bad, in our language, I didn't know he was the high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not revile the leader of the people. In other words, Paul said, I'm going to honor the office. The guy was still a hypocrite. He was still a whitewashed wall. But Paul didn't know he was the high priest because he honored the word of God and the office more than who was in that. And I think that's a lesson for us today. We need to honor what God honors, those who fear the Lord. That's not being afraid of the Lord if you know him. That is an awesome respect that we honor God above all. Are you on God's side? Who is on the Lord's side, that old hymn has? The next one's really important. Who's going to be invited to God's house to get an invitation to come spend time with him? He doesn't take up a reproach against his friend. He doesn't... He, he despises a reprobate, somebody that rejects God. He honors those that fear the Lord. And then this is a really important one. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. This is a man or a woman that gives his yes, yes, or no, no, and keeps it. Did you know that your word's one of the only things that you can give and keep at the same time? Think about that. The only, one of the only things you can give and keep at the same time. You can keep your word and you can give your word. And that's what God intends for us to be. Some of my closest friends are not the smartest. They're not the wealthiest. They're not the biggest, strongest. Not the, some of them are just ordinary people. But do you know why I count them as some of my closest friends? Because they're faithful. If they give their word, they're going to stick with it. There were some people named Gibeonites. And Joshua had been commanded to lead the army to kill all the people in the land and drive them out. Don't make a treaty with any of them. I'm judging those people of the land and drive them all out and the Israelites are going to inherit this land. So they're defeating one nation after another and they come up to a people who've got old clothes on, they've got old moldy bread, their bags that they kept wine in are all leaking and everything because... And they say, Joshua, we've come from a long, long way off. In other words, they're saying, we're not part of the land here. Would you make a treaty with us? And the scripture says, Joshua didn't ask counsel at the mouth of the Lord. He didn't pray and ask God what to do. So he said, sure. He gave his word. We'll be protection to us. Come and join us. Three days later, guess where they show up? Those people's hometown, Gibeah. And Joshua said, what in the world did you do? You lied to us like you were from a far off land. And they said, we knew you were going to destroy us. We were desperate. We needed to do something and we tricked you. And, and they thought, okay, Joshua was going to command his men, draw the sword. But what did Joshua do? He said, I gave my word and I will not go back on it. If you enter into a legal contract with someone, 
Now, this gets a little sticky sometimes. You uh, legal, legally sign your name. The other person signs their name. What if they back out on that contract? Are you still responsible? You may say, well, legally, you know, if they default and the contract falls apart. But we are still to keep our word. We're still to be faithful. And notice what it says there. He swears to his own hurt. Oh, no, I made a, an agreement. I shook hands. I gave my word, but I didn't know it was this circumstance. Have you ever done that? I didn't know that that's what was going to take place. God says, I'm looking for the people that will keep their word, even though it hurts them. Even though they suffer, they lose Somebody might have tricked them, but if they gave their word, they're going to keep their word. Number five, he does not put out his money at interest. The Old Testament, a lot of times, interest is called usury. And it's a good way to write that because you're using somebody else's disadvantage. The Bible teaches us in Deuteronomy and Levit Leviticus that the Jews were not supposed to charge interest to their brothers. Now, they could charge interest to Gentiles. They could charge interest in a business dealing. But when a brother or sister was down and out and they were, they were hungry and they were without, God said, do not take advantage of them. Do not take advantage of them. Guess what movie I watched yesterday? It's a Wonderful Life. I watched it again. I don't know how many times I've watched it in my life, but did somebody in that movie trick somebody else all the time, take advantage of them, want to charge them interest, usury? I think we ought to have It's a Wonderful Life too. What Happened to Potter. I want him to get his due is what I want. Somebody needs to make that movie. This guy doesn't put out his money at interest. He doesn't cheat. I said something that took place about a person that I know very well in a Bible study about a banker who was dishonest and wanted to charge a lot of interest. I didn't know that there was either a federal bank examiner in the audience that day or somebody that worked in that same. And he turned to the man next to me and said, that guy's not telling the truth. Nobody would ever do that. They'd get in trouble. He left and never came back as far as I know. But I was telling the truth because that person was a member of my family. There are people that misuse money for their own advantage. And God says, don't do it. You're not going to get invited to my house if you do. It's not loving things and using people. It's loving people and using things. And that's the difference on the way we handle money. Now let me go quickly. The next part. Nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. That's a payoff. That's dirty money. How important is it for our judges to be like this? Let's say somebody of your family was accused of doing something. They're going to go to a, a courtroom. They are charged with a crime. Somebody's accused them of doing something. But you know the person that's accusing them has a lot of money. And do we honor a, a judicial system where that person could go to the judge and say, here, you know, you make sure this turns out in my favor and I'm going to give you this. No, we would never want that to happen to our family member, would we? Well, God doesn't either. And he says here, the person that's going to be with me does not take a bribe against the innocent. If someone can be bought off, they have no character at all. And then the great statement at the end of this, he or she, talking about either one, who does these things will never be shaken. It's really important the word does. That's one of those verbs that sticks out again. It doesn't say he that knows these things, he that can quote these things, he that wrote these things. It says he that does these things, that lives like this, where it will never be shaken. David said, I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. You want to get invited to God's house? You want to hang out with the right person, the right people? 
Psalm 15 tells us these people had the right stuff. David said in another place, one thing have I desired and that will I seek after, to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and to inquire in his temple, behold his beauty. That's what David wanted above everything else. And God tells us this is how it can happen. Someone asked me one time and they gave me a gift. What is your life verse? Well, I have a lot of life verses because I love them all. But I love Micah 6, 8. Does God require rivers of oil? Does he want um, your firstborn? Is that what he wants you to do? Does he want you to do some great thing to earn salvation? No, it says, God has shown you, old man, what is good and right and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly to love mercy or kindness and to walk humbly with your God. You wanna be invited to God's house, that's the kind of people we gotta be. Faithful, trustworthy, can't be bribed, can't be bought off, would not hurt another person for anything in the world. They love what God loves, they hate what God hates. Psalm 15. When I think of Psalm 15, I end it always with, dear God, make me a man like that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these words written so long ago that are so timely for us today because every one of these things and these pressures and these temptations, they take place to us. The world is offering us a deal. Just take this bribe. Just mistreat someone. You can get ahead by harming someone else. Oh, Jesus, give us strength to be like you. Give us strength to be wise as serpent, but harmless as doves. Give us strength that when our life is all said and done, you could look at Psalm 15 and say, she did it well, he did it well. They let me do these things inside of them that we might have that wonderful promise at the end too. The person who does this will never be shaken. They'll be steady. They'll be solid. They'll be strong. They'll be in place. They can dwell on God's holy hill. They are invited into his tent. They're welcome at his campfire. Thank you for Psalm 15. In Jesus' name, amen.